If you're a guest with us, we are in the book of Galatians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn over to that, we are going to pick back up where we were last week. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia, dealing with some specific issues that they had come up. Performance-based salvation. So a church that is constituted on the free grace of God and the faith of its people had become to be taught and were in danger of believing that they were somehow able to perform or work their way into a good relationship with God. And so Paul's writing specifically about that. And so we've been trying to spend the last few weeks looking at how that applies to our own life. And so remember, last week I told you a story about a change of command. Young guy stepped up to the, uh, to the microphone and he talked about, you know, that he knew that he wasn't, uh, he didn't earn it, that he wasn't worthy of the position that he had been tapped for, but that he was going to work hard uh, to earn it. And so he realized he didn't deserve it, but he wanted to work hard for earning it. And, and that's a good thing in the Marine Corps. Uh, that's a good thing as a husband. When I married my wife, I knew that I was uh, batting way above my league. Uh, and so I know I, don't, I know I don't deserve it, but I will work hard to try to earn that blessing. Same thing with my kids, same thing with my, my church and, and being able to be your pastor. Um, and so when we talk about it like that, it doesn't seem that big a deal. But when we use that logic to think about our salvation and our relationship with God, that we don't deserve it, but we're going to try to earn it, that's dangerous. In fact, when we think like that, we're falling right into what Paul talks about as being another gospel, which is really no gospel at all. And so we have to guard our hearts in that. So the the main idea for our text in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 12 is this. Do not accept justification by works, but instead stand firm in the freedom of faith working through love. And so this book has all been about standing firm in what God has done for us and what we believe who God is and not giving into uh, a different type of teaching, a different type of temptation in our own life. And so I want to read. Uh, the first verse that sets the tone for the rest of the book, it says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so if you remember, as people, we have been set free from the slavery of following the law for our salvation. So if you think about it, there's really two types of, of slavery that's involved here. There's a slavery to the flesh, so we all have fleshly desires, and so if you've ever uh, wanted to do something, but your, your body and your mind kept pushing you to do something different, that, that pushing you to do something different and the inability by ourselves to do something different is slavery that Paul's talking about. That our flesh desires sin and it will continue to be a slave until it is set free. And the law makes us a slave to it to try to earn our way into salvation because none of us are able to do that. When I say that none of us are able to do that, I don't mean that you're 100% a terrible person all the time, okay? Let's just assume for the second that we're not all 100% of the time rotten people. You're probably a pretty good person. You work hard. Uh, you've worked hard in your life. You, you maybe have a spouse, a husband, a wife. Uh, you're a mother or father. Uh, you're in the Marine Corps. You're in the Navy. You're something where your life is filled with other things, and so you you're generally a pretty good person in that time. But when we look at the law, the law looks for perfection. So anytime you and I are not perfect, we are breaking the law. And we are in slavery to breaking the law because we are not able to fulfill the law. And so when we think about slavery, when Paul uses that language, this is what he's talking about. And he says to the Christians in, in these churches and to us this morning by extension, you have been set free from a revol uh, revolving around that lifestyle relating to who God is in a relationship with Him. You don't have to earn that. We don't deserve it, but we, we don't have to earn that. You've been set free. And so, you might ask how gospel is a pathway out of slavery. It's like this. Christ in His death, life, death, and resurrection, He redeemed us, which is a is a purchasing. He purchased us out of slavery. So think about if you've ever been to a flea market. I grew up in South Carolina. Flea markets were a really big deal. And so you would go to this big open field with all these tables and people would have the coolest things for sale. 
uh, and we would always drift back. When I was with my dad, we would buy chickens and animals and all kinds of things and bring them back to the house. It was always the best thing, a flea market. So, And the flea market rules are different than rules at, like, say, Walmart or Kmart or something like that. When you go into those places, the price is the price. But when you're in a flea market, you can be like, hey, no, no, I'll give you $10 for those 14 things that I don't need, but I'm not going to pay you $15 for that. And so in a flea market, it's got its own set of rules. A market has its own set of value system and that kind of thing. And we were in slavery in the marketplace of sin, when we talk about redemption, that we've been set free, that God came in there and paid the price that got us out of that. And that His righteousness, Christ's perfect life, was credited to our account before the Lord. You and I don't have the money to make that payment, but Jesus has done that perfectly. And so when we say we've been set free, it's that Jesus walked up and said, no, I know that that Ryan doesn't have this, Put it on my tab. And so that's credited to my life. And so I've been set free from having to earn anything in terms of my relationship with God. And so when we talk about being set free, it also means that he gave us his spirit in order that we might be able to now live as he's called us to live. So without his spirit, we are always unable to, to, walk, to walk the walk and to talk the talk. But when he gives us his spirit, we are now able to do that. Now, we don't do that perfectly, but over the course of your life, you probably notice that, you know, we think about it in debt. When I was young, I had younger, I had more credit card debt. I don't have any credit card debt now. And so, but it didn't happen like that. And so back in the day, I might have, you know, let's say $2,000 worth of credit card debt. And I wasn't out of that all the way, but maybe a few months later, I was like, yeah, but I only owe $1,500 now. And a few months later, I only owe $1,000 now. And then a few months later, only 500 now. And so the same thing happens with our, our growth and our sanctification. When Christ set us free, we may not be perfect in that moment. But as we grow in the spirit and we grow in righteousness, thank God we're not who we used to be. We're not, we're not who we're supposed to be yet, but we are not who we used to be. And so there's a growth there. And all of that comes to us because Christ has set us free. And Paul says, why would you ever... Submit again to a yoke of slavery. What what version of the world exists right now that you would trade being free and saved and full of God's spirit, that you would trade that to go back into the slavery that you used to live in? It used to be a part of your life. The lifestyle that you were living or the choices that you were making or the inability to earn God's love. Why would you ever want to submit yourself to that again? And, and Paul says, we, we shouldn't do that. We, we can't do that. We've been set free. And so verse 2 says this, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, for for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And so Paul says, listen, if you go back to accepting circumcision as a legitimate way of being saved, then Christ is of no value to you. And so remember, if you've ever been in Sunday school, they talked about this. uh, Circumcision is an outward sign of a covenant heart with the Lord, and so it's something that he gave to Abraham and all of his descendants that they would be circumcised on the eighth day as a sign. In many ways, we have a a similar sign in the church. When someone gives their heart to Christ, they are baptized. And so it's a sign of an inward thing in our hearts. But sometimes people see baptism as salvific, meaning that if I'm not baptized, I'm not saved. All right, we don't give that level of importance to baptism, even though it is importance. But same thing in the Old Testament that they say, well, listen, i got to be circumcised so I can be saved. Completely blow, blowing right by the faith part. Like, I don't have to believe in God. i just got to be circumcised, and then I will have checked the box that is the most important, and God will save me. And if you feel like that about circumcision, you feel like that about all sorts of things in your life. How much money you give to the, to the temple, how you live your life, following the Sabbath. All, I mean, once you start with one rule, you got to kind of keep them all. And so this is disposition here. And Paul says, church, he's talking to these churches, if you go back to that, 
Christ will be of no advantage to you. Let's talk about that for a second. When when I stand before the Lord, let's let's say something catastrophic happens here today and we're all in line together, okay? You do not want to be behind me in line, but let's just say that we're walking up there together. And we're talking about our stories and we're, you know, we're taking in all the new sights and sounds, but you know, you think about standing in God's presence. And he asks us this question, why, you know, why why should I let you in? You start you start going down your bank account, your your spiritual account. You're like, well, technically you shouldn't. Like, I shouldn't be walking up the steps. I should be walking down the steps to the other place. Except Christ. He is of great advantage to us. He makes all the difference. No matter what your life is like, no matter how what you've done or what you will do, being in Christ tips the scales in the opposite direction. And Paul says, if you submit again to a performance-based salvation model, Jesus, he's gone. He's of no advantage. There's nothing that what he offers will be applied to you. You'll be there on your own manner. And the reason is, is once you try to relate to God in a earn it mentality, then you got to earn it. All right. I used to think when I was a younger man in college, I had this conversation with my dad. I was like, listen, I don't need your money. I go live on my own. I'll, I'll move out of the house. I'll, I'll pay my own bills. All right. Little did I know how many, how many bills are out there. Uh, and so my guy was like, I mean, my, my dad was like, okay, all right. And then you start going through, like, you, you owe me rent for the house you live in. You owe me money for the food that's on the table. You owe me, you owe me if you're going to earn it, here's what the bill is. And that's just like what happens with us when we try to relate to God that way. There is an enormous bill that now we must fulfill. And Paul says, if you try to relate to God in one law, you have to keep it all. In, in this topic of cir- circumcision, a physical outward sign, so we all know what circumcision is. Paul uses this language that, okay, if you want to relate to God based on your circumcision or, or your outward sign, then you are severed from Christ. You know, circumcision was given as a physical sign to and give us an understanding of an internal spiritual thing, that, that our hearts, the New Testament says, are circumcised, that the old flesh that we used to be in has been cut away and we are now holy in Christ. And so when you try to relate to God on your own works, and I mean, there are a lot of good things that you've done in your life. Many of you have served courageously in the military. Many of you have taken bullets for our freedom. Many of you mothers out there I think about who have labored to raise your children in the knowledge of the Lord. And we know that that's the hardest job in all the world is being a mother and raising your children. I mean, there's so many, I look out there, there's so many of you have lived a life and are living a life that is worthy and and noteworthy and important. But when you try to relate to God like that, man, it all bets are off. You've got to you've got to earn it. I love how in verse five here. Well, let me back up. He says you've fallen away from grace. You you were trying to relate to God on his in His grace, but now you've tried to earn that, and, and so now you've. It's not just about circumcision. It's about the whole law. I mean, you need to pay attention to what you eat from here on out. You need to pay attention to what you do from here on out. You need to pay attention to the, to, sun, to Saturday, Sabbath. That's a pretty big one in the Ten Commandments. Uh, you need to pay attention to how you look at people and how you talk to people. All those things now become so important because your salvation depends on it. You've fallen away from relating to God in grace. Now you're relating Him by your own merit. And then the weight of all of the law comes on your shoulders. To say it a different way, all that Jesus did for you on the cross now becomes your destiny. You will die for any sin that you commit. And that's the thing about God's law. It's not that he's he's hoping that we get 75 percent of it right or he's he's hoping maybe that we all have a, a B average in our life in terms of getting the law right. If you break one law over the course of your life, the Old Testament says it's as if you broke all of them. And you may think, and I may think that that's unfair, but what it is is a beautiful picture to the righteousness of who God is. 
and who he created you and I to be before the fall in the story of Genesis. And it tells us also the life that Jesus Christ lived, that it is possible that Jesus did do this and we can have that relationship. But if you're if you're in here and you're thinking, how can I better relate to God on my own terms? Then none of this is a value to you. You've fallen away from God. You've fallen away from God. There's a set of steps right here. And so if I'm walking on the stage as a good relationship with God, but I try to earn my own way, it's as if I just take a step off the stage and I'm gone. But the sad thing is there's no stairway back. There's no way back trying to relate to God as long as I try to relate to Him on our own. But he says in verse 5, for, the, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. And so here's the thing about salvation by works. It promises you something in the immediate, but the gospel gives us hope for the future. And so even though I am in Christ, and even though we put our faith in Christ, we've been baptized, and our sins are forgiven, and we have a right relationship with God, there's an element to our salvation that lies ahead of us. Our complete salvation, our complete glorification and righteousness is not experienced in the whole right here. It is experienced only when Jesus returns and we and our faith becomes sight. And so Paul reminds them that their hope is through the Spirit by faith and it is something that is yet to happen. Works-based salvation offers you something right away. But a faith-based salvation saves you now and gives you a hope for the future. Imagine thinking whether or not you did enough to get saved, what that life would be like. Would you be anticipating that relate that conversation with the Lord when you pulled out the story of your life and went down it line by line? But when we believe God and all that He told us in the gospel, and we stand firm on what Christ has offered us, we can look with anticipation in that conversation. We don't have to be someone who is always burdened over what they've done. And Paul goes on to say that for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts. All right, no big deal. Either way. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. In other words, he's saying the only thing that counts is walking by faith in how we love other people. That's the summary of what it means to be a Christian. If you're a Christian, that's what it means to walk by faith in love. All right, there's a lot else there. You know, the, the depth of that phrase goes a long way. But generally speaking, to be a Christian is to walk by faith and love. Walk by faith and love. Not love how the world or popular wisdom might classify love, but walking by faith and love how the Bible teaches that. And so it's really practical. What truly matters and that which our actions and our lives should be measured is are we in Christ and what we have done is it in the Lord? So when you think about your relationship to God, do you are you loving Him in faith? What, what we do here in worship, when we give our tithes and offerings, when we serve, all of what is encapsulated in our worship relationship to God in that, is, is it done in faith? And is it done in a loving way? Think about your spouse. Spouse, do you love your spouse in faith through love? This may surprise you, um, but I do not deserve my wife's love all the time. All right? A amen? 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 She's smiling. She says she's got amen in her eyes. Uh, I don't even deserve the love. As your pastor, there are some times that I'm, a lot of times I can be hard-headed and frustrating and do things that are crazy. Evident, we are in a high school auditorium this summer. Uh, but my wife, in her relationship with God, is on the hook, not to me, but to the Lord, to love me. And I am on the hook as well, because I am a Christian. And so God says, that's your wife, you love her, not every time that she deserves it. You love your husband, not every time he deserves it. Not even because they deserve it, but because I've called you to that and you trust me that this is what my perfect will is and this is what I want for you. And you say, you know what, God, I don't understand why this is what I should be doing, but I trust your, I trust your word and I trust your heart and so therefore I'm going to love. And so that's what Christian marriage looks like. The same thing in parent, 
relationship with your children or children, brothers and sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters and sisters. You are respectful and loving towards them, not because they deserve it. Most of the time, they're probably not going to deserve it. You do it as a Christian in faith through love. I'm going to love you because God is real and he's called me to that. and He's given me his spirit. So that's what I'm going to do. And the church does that to the world. The world right now, not big on the church. All right. American in specific, not really crazy about biblical principles. And so what's our posture towards the world when they're negative towards us or they might be persecuting or, or harsh towards us? The posture doesn't change. We, in faith to God, are loving towards our neighbors and our enemies. We will overcome them in the end through our love. We will not overcome them by our might, by our money, by our strength, by any of those things. We overcome them the same way that Jesus overcame them, through the power of God. And that's we're called to that in faith through love. And so Paul says, don't go back to that other way because this is the way that God has called you to. But you'll notice that in the remaining scriptures that we have for this morning, there's a big tone shift going on with Paul in his conversation. So he's been dealing specifically to these church, these churches, but now he's going to draw his attention on those who have been misleading the church. And so you're going to notice that his language gets a lot more hostile towards them. And, and don't just try to explain that away this morning. Don't, don't just skip over that and be like, that's no big deal because that's usually how he talked back then. Notice the anger in his voice and the judgment in his voice towards those inside the church who were trying to mislead God's people in their relationship to him through faith. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. And so he's talking specifically about these false teachers. And so these are the people inside the church who are spreading a false doctrine of salvation by works, a performance-based salvation. And Paul's dealing with them specifically. But notice, it's a little bit easier, I think, for Paul and his day because these people were inside the church. It's a little tricky for us. I'll be honest, as one of your pastors, I don't have to just listen and look for the people inside of our church who are spreading false gospels. You have access on your TV. You have access in newspapers. If anybody still reads those things. You have access through internet and social media. I mean, you can you can get on your phone right now and listen to a preacher live 2,000, year, 2000 miles away. And so you have all of this these ideas and this teaching that is available to you. And so part of the thing the church has to work through is dealing with these false, these heretics and false teachers when they come alive. And so Paul's dealing specifically with the ones that are in his church and he's angry about it. And he says, he says this, whoever makes you move away from faith towards a workspace salvation is not someone who is sent from God. So if you ever hear something in my sermons, if you ever hear something in a sermons of another that makes you feel like you need to earn your relationship with God, that you need to do more or do better, that it's not something that you take hold of by faith, that person is not speaking on behalf of the Bible and is not speaking on behalf of God. And so sometimes be a little gracious. Sometimes poor preaching may seem like that, but, but you need to always listen. Like, is this, is this teacher giving me something that is faith-based or is this person teaching me something that's works-based? Because works-based is really popular these days. You know, you can be saved, whatever that means, by just being yourself and doing what's true to you. And if you're just you're faithful to do what you think is right, then God will most certainly save you. Now that's not salvation through circumcision and works of the law, but it is the same type of salvation. It is something that you tackle and accomplish yourself. It is not something that God gives to you and works in you through His Spirit. And Paul says a little bit of this nonsense goes a long way. All right, Anytime you get this kind of teaching, it goes a long way. 
Because, boy, I tell you what, we love to earn our way into things, okay? For some of you in here, if I took you to lunch and I offered to buy your lunch for you and there was no way for you to contribute to that at all, boy, that would make you so, you can't do that for me, preacher. Pastor, let me, let me buy your lunch. No, 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 this is something I want to do for you. And you're like, absolutely not. There's, let me pay your house payment. Now, some of you are like, sure, I'll do that. Hey, where, where I sign up for that list? But, but you think about it. If somebody came in here right now and offered, offered to pay for your meal or offered to, to take a medical bill off your plate or offered to take a little bit of cut your grass one Sunday or one, one week. We don't cut grass on Sunday. Bad things happen to you. But, but, uh, but offer to do something like that for you. Is your heart to say thank you? Is your heart to say, you know what, I got it. We do, we do like to earn our keep. And there's nothing wrong with that unless you're trying to deal and relate to God. Then, then there's something incredibly wrong with it. And so a little bit of this earning goes a long way. So that makes sense why Paul wants to strike it right away. And I've told you all before, there's a lot of things in the church we ought to be gracious about, we ought to be flexible about. There's disagreeing opinions on different types of doctrine. But if you start preaching a works-based salvation, don't be shocked at the sternness of the response. Because there are some things that if you allow that to creep into a life, in an individual or a small group or a church, it will ravage the church. So Paul doesn't deal with every bit of false teaching with the same tone, but he deals with this one in a severe way. And we should, we should pay attention to that. And it's always in the church. I, I wish I could say that I could envision a day where we don't have to face this temptation or there's not possibility of myself or one, another person coming in one day and teaching this, but we've got 2,000 years to look back on. Church, this is something we always have to struggle with. We have to listen to what the world's saying. We have to listen to what others are saying and make sure it lines up with the gospel. And so the church has always been at war with the world but it is also at war with itself. Always reforming. Always making sure that it's pure and that our teaching lines up with the Bible. And this is never going to change until Jesus comes back and does His thing. Every generation must pay attention to this. So if you're in here right now and that you know, 10, 20, 30 year old and, and you're trying to figure things out and you're thinking what God might do in your life one day, if He calls you into ministry, if He calls you into to missions, if He if He leads you, which I hope He will, to a church to be a healthy member for the rest of your life, you will always have to deal with this because it is always around. People trying to pervert the one true gospel. And so skipping down, though, notice that Paul says, if I'm preaching circumcision, then why am I, get, why am I suffering? Clearly, Paul's not teaching what those guys are teaching. He's teaching something completely different. And he uses a phrase, he goes, if I preached salvation by works, then I would remove the offense of the cross. And so I want to, I want to talk to you just a brief moment about that as we wrap up, about the offense of the cross. There's something about you can't save yourself that is offensive. There's something about you are in need of being saved in the first place that is offensive. There's something that says only the cross and the work of Jesus on the cross on your behalf can save you that is offensive. And so when we preach the cross, we can't remove the offense. It is offensive. Now, we don't need to be jerks about it. We don't need to be harsh about it. We don't need to be unloving about it. But if you preach the pure gospel of Christ alone, the world will be offended. And depending on when you live and where you live, the pushback might be severe. And so Paul says we can't remove the offense of the gospel. It tells us that we are that, the, that we are uh, we are sinners in need of salvation. That we're rebelling in our life apart from God. That we're wrong. Go out and try to tell somebody in our society right now. Shoot, tell somebody across the aisle that they're wrong about something, and see what kind of response you get. That you're under God's wrath. This loving heavenly Father that we talk about has wrath for those that are disobedient. See what kind of response you get from that. That you can't save yourselves. That if you were given all of the benefits that you wanted, you would still not be able to save yourself from your sin. 
people would get angry. They'd tell you to shut up, to be quiet. They'd even try to silence you themselves because the cross, when it is offensive, hurts our feelings. So we live in a day and age right now, and Carl Truman has nailed this in his work. He says, the modern self, so our current understanding of ourselves as a, as a nation and in the world, most of the Western world, is one where authenticity is achieved by acting outwardly in accordance with one's inward feelings. So the way that you know that you're being you is whatever you feel is true about you on the inside, in your heart and in your mind, you have to align your outward appearance with those things. And anyone who tries to say your outward appearance or your inward feelings is not correct or that's not right or there's a better way, that person is encroaching in territory they have no business talking about. And so that's, that's true. How you feel, what you think about yourself is the most important opinion in the world about who you are. It's not a school system. It's not a church. It's not a pastor. It's not the God of Scripture. It's not government. No one should be able to tell you no if that's what you think is right. And God is not going to give an inch. Christ is the only way to be saved. Christ is the only way that you and I can be saved from our sins. There's no other way. And to preach that is offensive. And then Paul says something that seems like shocking. Like somebody's, somebody snuck in when Paul was taking a nap and added a line to his, to his letter. But that wasn't Paul. But, but notice that in the beginning of Galatians, Paul says that if, if I or anyone else preaches a different gospel to you, then let that person be accursed, cast far away from God. And now he says, let them be emasculated. And so if this person who's preaching a works-based salvation really thinks they can be saved by their works, well, there's a, there's a line in Deuteronomy chapter 23 that it says, if anyone is, is crushed or is severed, that they can never enter into the presence of God. And so what Paul's saying is, if that's how you want to relate to God, then why don't you go ahead and completely remove yourself from being in His presence at all? Now, I know this offends our contemporary mindset that that's not how we deal with people we disagree with or enemies. But make no mistake, Paul and the early church and Jesus in the book of Revelation is quite hostile to those in the church misleading people. In fact, Jesus says, if you make one of these little ones fall away, you should wrap a millstone around your neck and throw it over the dock. What we're talking about this morning is serious. The gospel is serious. And what we believe about the gospel is serious. And it impacts every area of our life. And so as you think about how you are to relate to God this morning, church. It's very plain and simple. One way is for life, and the other way is for death. And I would encourage you again, do not accept justification by works, but instead stand firm in the freedom of faith, working through love.